Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, good to see you all. Thanks very much for inviting us over. Uh, as Sean mentioned, we're from the UK. Thank you. Um, we're from the UK, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit about some of our observations on the analysis work that we do uh, in the UK. And I've called it from too tough to everyday easy. So this is how to turn the things that you hate doing once a year into things that are really pleasurable every week and becoming a hero uh, amongst your colleagues in your business. So a little bit about me very briefly. Um, I'm the founder and uh, managing director of Atheon Analytics. I also describe myself as our chief data animator. And we, we use that term data animator because for us, uh, most of our work is, is visual analytics. We, uh, we use Tableau, we use uh, Exasol. We'll talk a little bit about some of those tools along the way later. But for us, visual analytics is bringing data to life, humanizing it by making it interactive and visual at the same time. And I think um, I'm following a perfect example of that from the Tableau demo in terms of fast, uh, insightful an analysis, uh, helping us to find patterns in business performance. That's really what we're about. Um, Atheon's the company. We also have a product called SkewTrack. So I'm here sort of wearing two hats at this conference. I'm a customer. SkewTrack, our product, uses Exasol under the covers uh, to, to power all of the work that it does. We collect data from about 450 um, suppliers to supermarkets in the UK every day, put all that data together and make it available to them to look at their businesses in a different way. And SkewTrack, therefore, is a, a customer of Exasol um, to, 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 to power its platform. And then the other part of the business is a kind of consulting uh, operation, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today, where we help businesses just to look at themselves differently and address uh, the kind of challenges that they face, as I say, on an everyday basis, but can only really address once a year, because these are big, um, painful tasks. So let's take a look at what I mean by this. So we all have a to-do list, right? Um, it sort of looks something like this. Certainly, if you work in retail, um, you'll have something that looks fairly like this if you work in the trading team. You've got a fairly repetitive weekly cycle, loads of things to do. The, the to-do list never quite gets done, or at least mine never quite gets done. Um, things rise to the top, hopefully, and you pick them up and do them, but just down the bottom left-hand corner of that to-do list, there's this really sort of nagging bit that you never quite get to. The things that you know you ought to go and look at, the things that really would probably make a big difference to the business is if you could get your head around them, if you could figure out what's going on, but they're just too tough. They're just uncomfortable, painful. We'll put them off till next week. Oh, we'll look at them next month. Oh, they become special projects. So in retail, um, which is where we work, most of our clients are either supermarket retailers or suppliers to supermarket retailers. The kind of things that these guys are interested in, have we got the right product, product range? Are we actually selling the things that our customers want? When we run promotions and put the price down on things, is that actually good for us? Or are we killing our own profits. Um, have we got the right products in the depots? Are we moving product through our supply chain correctly? Now, these aren't things that you can just instantly get an answer to. They're complex, difficult, tough questions. And for most of our clients, most of the businesses we work with, they just don't get around to it. It's just all a bit too tough. Why is that too tough? What are the kind of uh, hallmarks of a too tough item? So a lot of these things are just down to the time we have available. Day-to-day um, -day business pressures, we've all got uh, 101 things to do, another 10 get dumped on us at the start of the week, and we just don't get around to some of these difficult uh, activities. So firefighting would be the phrase we use in the UK. We're constantly trying to put out little fires, things that are going wrong. We don't quite get around to the things that we know would stop the fires occurring in the first place. In many cases, and certainly um, I think a lot of people outside retail think of it as uh, a beacon of understanding how to solve complex business problems. Big retailers have vast amounts of data, huge uh, store networks, uh, complex supply chains, and they should be able to solve all these problems. Well, working inside it, it's not always quite that simple, and we'd love to have all the right techniques and tools and methods and approaches. We don't. So a lot of the time, we're working with teams who simply don't know how to solve the problem. They don't have the right tools. They don't have the right methods and techniques. And that means that things that might actually be achievable just appear too tough. And rather than figuring out, could we use some maths for this, as, as Hannah was talking about earlier, 
could we um, use some visualization for this? We just don't get around to it. It just sits in the too tough list. Um, and that, I suppose, ties in with a lot of the people that we work with are surprisingly inexperienced. So we've got, we work with um, buyers and trading uh, managers inside uh, these big retailers. These are often people with three or four years experience. They're mid-20s. They're managing 300, 400, 500 million pounds worth of spend. And they have, um, they've had training, they've had some guidance, they just don't have experience. They don't necessarily have the expertise to solve some of these problems. And if you're pressed for time, you don't have the right tools and the methods, and you don't have the expertise and the experience, it just makes things too tough. I'll just put it off. We'll, we'll get to it another day. We, we won't get around to it today. And we have an expression in England, I don't know whether it translates across uh, the 16 countries here present, about you can't see the wood for the trees. So when you're, in the, when you're in a forest, in a wood, surrounded by trees, it's extremely hard to know, are you in a big forest? Are you in a small forest? Is it actually quite easy to navigate this thing? And sometimes what appears to be a giant forest, a huge problem, is actually relatively straightforward to solve if you just look at it differently. If you can get a different perspective, step outside the immediate problem, step away from the too tough list, and have a look at it objectively, perhaps actually it's not quite as tough as it might first appear. I'm just going to step sideways now and talk a little bit about um, why do things get on the too tough list in the first place and what is the kind of essence of um, the kind of problems that appear there. So I'm going to flip to uh, back to 2002, I'm going to take you to uh, Donald Rumsfeld um, and a very famous speech. And, and that caused a huge amount of hilarity at the time and Rumsfeld was lampooned and um, people you know, said he was trying to avoid the question and so on, but actually, okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, actually, he makes a really good point. And the more time I've spent listening to that, and I've listened to it a lot, by the way, I've, I talk about this quite a, quite a lot. I certainly talk about it to my team internally and to a lot of my customers. The more you think about it, the more insightful it becomes. Um, known knowns is a great way of describing what most of us do with most of our data most of the time. So business reporting, and a lot of our businesses, by the way, will meet an analytics team, and really they're not doing analytics, they're doing reporting. They're really the BI team, but they've just been given the data science or analytics title. Really what they're doing is they are saying, well, we already have a mental model of our business. We know how it works. We have a theoretical plan of what it does. It's budgets, it's forecast, we know how it worked last year. And we can just compare ourselves to that. And that will tell us whether we're doing well or badly. And, and that's all we need to do. And actually, for known known problems, we know what we know. It makes an awful lot of sense. This is the what of measurement. This is what's happening in my business. What's it doing? Is it a, a behaving as I expect it to? But analysis, analytics, sits in the domain of known unknowns. So these are things that we don't know the answer to this, we don't have a mental model for it, we don't know why it happens, and we're curious, we'd like to find out, we think if we could find out we could help to improve our organisation, we could make it more profitable, we could make it respond faster, we could help the people in it. Um, we want to try and address things that we simply don't know the answer to. So, Good analysis, and um, certainly the examples that, that, that Hannah gave and um, that we've heard, we've seen um, the Tableau present as well, good analysis tackles known unknowns. It looks for the things we don't know enough about. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase what we know. We're trying to move things from known unknown into known known. We're trying to create a mental map and a mental model of how customers buy our products or whether our shops are optimized or have we got the right product flowing through our supply chain? That's our goal, but we don't know. So we're off to explore it. So we're looking for patterns, we're looking for insights, we're looking, hopefully, to pull out of vast sets of data new understanding of how our business is operating. And, and that's the why and the how of measurement. It's much more interesting, certainly to me, than the what. Um, and it's what I think those of us in the room, and I think, actually, you know, I'm talking to a room of, of uh, analysts here, you, you sit in this domain. This is, this is where you're most interested. Um, and so, a lot of the things that we see on people's too tough lists, when we look at 
the kind of audience we work with, it's really analytical problems. It's things that they don't know the answer to and they have no mental map. They don't know how to go looking for the answer. Um, and so the question, I guess, is, is genuine analysis, really insightful analysis, analysis that's going to answer tough questions, is that just too tough? Is it too difficult to do? Well, let's try and break down what these two tough list items look like. Why are they too tough? And can we find some ways around them? What would we need to create in terms of a solution uh, structure in order to address them? So first of all, there are very, uh, very rarely is one simple answer to the question. There are many possible answers. There are many ways to understand or to look at how customers behave or to optimize supply chains or to range products in store. All these things that uh, our clients face are there is no one right answer. There are better solutions and worse solutions. There are better answers and worse answers. But finding a definitive answer is always going to be difficult. And knowing what approach to take to get there is also difficult. So the lack of expertise, lack of experience, tends to mean that people don't know where to start. Secondly, data. So big reason you know, we're here talking about Exosol and uh, the reason that we use Exosol is it's, it's become a, a staple part of our consulting offer, the ability to pull large, complicated data sets together quickly and start to um, work across them. But if you don't have those tools and those techniques, and a lot of our clients don't at the moment, we are working on that with, uh, with the team here at Exosol, but our clients who have more traditional database environments don't, can't get hold of this data quickly. And if they can get hold of it, they get hold of it from multiple different points and they can't make sense of putting it together and they've got some stuff in spreadsheets and they've got market analysis that's going on that's telling them how their competitors are doing and they're trying to piece that together with internal trading data. Just really difficult to, to put together. And then we find there are gaps in the data and the usual kind of mess that I'm sure many of you come across in uh, trying to solve problems in your own businesses. Critical one which still amazes me in the retail sector given the retail sectors work on things like um, global trade identification numbers, uh, barcodes, etc. is a real lack of master data. An awful lot of the organizations we work in just don't have good master data um, and a lack of structure in that, some of that data. Because these are problems that are not solved on a regular basis, there's little or no process. So the things that we're looking at tackling, there's not an obvious process. We haven't done it repeatedly. The last time we did it was a year ago. We were part of a team of five people that attack, tackled it. We didn't make great notes. We can't quite remember what we did. How do we go about it again this year? Bottom line, it's complex, it's unpleasant, and that's why it gets moved down the list. People naturally uh, move away from the things that they fear and uh, dislike, and so, these kind of problems are simply pushed to the bottom of the list. And typically when they are done, the kind of things we're talking about would take maybe five, six, seven people, five, six, seven weeks to do. So it's a big investment of time and effort, done once a year. It comes out with some insight and some benefit, but it's out of date a month later because customers are moving on, um, product uh, cha range changes are, are being applied. And so this, this problem looms again within a matter of weeks or uh, a couple of months. So overall, there are many good reasons why these things become too tough, but in plenty of cases, if you step back from them, take a look in a slightly different um, direction, they're not quite as bad as they seem. So in retail, I'm just going to talk about three, one, three particular problems um, briefly, and we'll go on to look at a couple of case studies. So. The right, getting the right product in the right shop at the right time for your customers is the critical um, problem of retailing. That's what every retailer is trying to do, understand what the customers want, get the product in the right shop, and make sure that it's the optimum range for that store. It's very, very difficult to do, but it's extremely difficult to do if you only do it once a year, and it takes you 26, 30, 30 weeks. And we've certainly worked with clients whose range review process takes that long, and we've helped them to shrink it. Um, Promotion. So all retailers run promotions. Certainly in the UK, in the supermarkets, it's a continuous process of running promotion after promotion after promotion. And do those really help to drive footfall, drive more customers in and drive profit? Lots of them don't, is the simple answer. Lots of them are simply loss making. Um, we often benefit as consumers, but the retailers don't always uh, get that right. 
and depot stocking. This is a question of have we put the right products in the right places in the right depots to serve customer demand. So three areas that are inherently complex and require data from multiple systems in many cases and just don't get looked at on a repeated basis. They become special projects done once a year, uh, once every two years. So if we could just magic up a solution, if we could figure out a way to address these problems, what would it need to look like? Well, first of all, it would need to be exploratory in some way. We need to be able to put together the data sets that we have with some kind of tool set that lets us explore that data really quickly because we don't know the answer to the problem. The, uh, the Tableau demonstration given earlier was a pretty uh, perfect example of exactly that. If you can put a great set of visual tools together with a very powerful database and you can explore that data incredibly rapidly, you can start to pull out lots of areas that are worth investigating further. Secondly, use visualization to identify patterns. Most of the people that we work with are not quants, they're not statisticians, they're not econometric um, experts, so helping them to find patterns, which may in turn be pushed back to a statistical team to validate, but helping the commercial guys to find patterns in data, find interesting behaviors, um, visualization is the most effective mechanism we've found for that. At the heart of what we're doing is large-scale data management, so we have to, any solution that we're gonna use here has to be able to assimilate large sets of data quickly and allow us to work on it in a very short amount of time. And a quick bit of navel gazing here, another UK expression. Um, how do we do that at Atheon? So I've already mentioned um, briefly, we're, we're a Tableau partner. We use Tableau um, for both our SKU track product and the consulting work we do. We've been working with Tableau for about uh, six years now and um, do work with other visualization tools as well, but Tableau is the one that we come back to pretty much every time. Um, over the past nine months, we have picked up Exasol first, sort of in a customer capacity and, and now as a partner as well, and it's transforming our ability to collect large data sets from clients for these consulting projects and put them together in a way that we can then explore them rapidly. Um, we're able to do that in timescales that I still find uh, amazing in that I'm still doing uh, bits of pieces in, uh, on projects in Exasol where I'm importing data and I'm, I'm convinced I've done it wrong because it cannot have loaded that much data that quickly. The little box we were awarded for yesterday, that's a real tool, we use that on site. I've put a quarter of a billion rows of data through that box and it performs beautifully. So uh, it's an incredibly powerful combination, those two together. We also do quite a bit of work with Alteryx um, for when we've got more complicated data um, transformation that's necessary and enrichment, particularly on um, geospatial data and so on, we'll use Alteryx to, uh, to help us as well. But some of the projects, um, are, you know, the data sets are actually quite simple. So, just want to take a look at a couple of case studies. If, if, you, if you have a tool set that can do this, and you have a mindset that says these problems are probably not quite as tough if you're prepared to compromise, if you're prepared to accept that some measurement is better than no measurement, if you can increase the amount of information you have about a problem and accept that it's never gonna be perfect, you're never gonna have all the information necessary to solve the problem um, perfectly, then actually you can do an awful lot with relatively little time and effort. So, a couple of case studies. First one here, um, waste optimization. So we did this project last year working with a, uh, a large, Convenience retailer, the largest convenience retailer in the UK. So these are small supermarkets that are kind of used typically to top up your weekly shop. It's not everything you get in a huge um, supermarket, but the kind of things you might need, bread, milk, eggs, cheese, etc. And the problem here was we're wasting too much product. We throw too much away. Why? And how can we reduce that whilst we still keep our uh, availability high. So this company had a big drive over three years to make sure that more of the key products were available more of the time in its stores, that it didn't run out of product. Brilliant. If you have perfect availability, every product is always available everywhere, you're going to have some waste. So the closer you get to perfection on uh, availability, the harder and harder it gets to avoid waste. So why is that a too tough problem? Well, 
They have about, each of their stores will have somewhere between five and 10,000 products, picked from about 30,000 of the, all the products they could be stocking. They have thousands of stores. They have hundreds of people in the trading team all being asked to address this and all tackling it slightly differently, if they're tackling it at all. Um, lots of different measures affect us here. How much are we selling? How much are we prepared to waste to get more sales? Is it acceptable to throw away a certain amount to get another few pounds in sales? Um, and many drivers that present the problem. So oversupply from misunderstood demand, that is forecasting um, with limited information, suggesting they needed more products in certain areas than perhaps they did. Uh, short shelf life products, so products that you bake in the morning and by the end of the night, if you haven't sold them, they're gonna be wasted. Big pack sizes. So if I'm taking a small convenience store and putting a pack of 24 things in it, can I sell all 24 before they go out of, um, out of date? And every time I run a promotion, I'm going to change all these things I've just figured out because I'm gonna create, I'm gonna inflate or deflate demand. How's that going to impact things? Um, the result, hundreds of millions of data points, vast amounts of data, um, various different business systems, and strangely, I suppose, um, strangely from the outside, perhaps when you're in the business, it makes sense, different definitions of how they cluster stores together, how, they, how do they organize stores and think of them as logical units, different parts of the business saw them differently. So a myriad of reasons why this was just overly complex and too tough, but they were wasting millions of pounds a month and they were actually wasting more than a million pounds a month, more than their budget. So they were prepared to, to lose some money doing this, but it got out of control. Um, and actually a very negative impact on their reputation. Um, this particular retailer is thought of as very um, socially conscious, very aware of um, uh, its customers and its sort of responsibility. And throwing food waste away has become a big, um, right across Europe, it's a, it's a topic that uh, all the retailers are being um, asked about. And certainly these guys felt that it was damaging their reputation. So definitely worth solving. So. This is, uh, this is the everyday easy solution. So we managed to pull all this together in about 40 man days of effort. So about two people for a month, roughly, pulled this together. And what it allows the buyers to do, I'm just, is there a laser, yes, is there a laser pointer on here? There is, I just don't know which button it is, I'm gonna. In the middle. Is it? In the button, in the middle. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what this allows people to do, and this is, this is built in Tableau, you've seen some Tableau work earlier, it allows people to see the most um, wasting products of all. So this is a list of the most wasting products. Every buyer can come in and pick their area and see the, area, the products that waste the most in their um, particular area. And it shows some information about how much money they're making or losing on those products and whether they're able to sell them before they run, they run out of life. If, um, if I've got a load of, um, if I've got 24 loaves of bread and I know I only sell 12 a day, I've got a real problem. Um, and then as we select one of these, up comes a breakdown of all the different types of stores, how these measures perform across the stores and how they perform over time, which starts out to see that particular waste problems, which show up here in red, tend to fall immediately after promotional peaks. We've got a product here that we're promoting a bit too much. And as a result, whenever we come to uh, close the promotion off, we're, running, we're, we're having to sell lots of it off at a discount and or throw it, throw it away in the bin. So really rapid way of going from a huge amount of data to a picture that lets people explore really quickly which products are wasting the most, why are they wasting that, in which stores, and behind all this there's a, a set of um, uh, more detail which lets them get down to actual lists of stores that they can take out and put into um, their supply chain system to stop listing those products, etc. So we moved here from a problem that they simply couldn't tackle, they, they hadn't got anywhere tackling it, to um, a pretty useful tool within uh, within about six weeks, the, the elapsed time. So what they have is an approximate model. They don't have an exact model. This isn't something necessarily that um, any of the numbers on that screen would be ratified by their finance team. Now that may be horrifying to some of you, but the idea is it's, pr it's pushing to the top of the list the things that need the most attention. 
it's roughly right rather than precisely accurate. So the margin numbers, for example, the, the profit that's being made is approximate, but it's useful, it's indicative. The variation to budgets is held at a slightly different level. So these are, these are imperfect solutions, but they're strongly indicative. So large amount of data available, it's understood and accessible by the, by the trading team, so the people who needed to use it understood it and could use it quickly. They were able to use it inside a day. They had some basic training and were actually making decisions and taking actions and changing products uh, in terms of what was in what store, so that they were st starting to save very quickly in, in, in just working in two or three areas of the business, tens of thousands of pounds a week by reducing waste. So, this was an annual process that they tried to do, is look back at the end of a year on what did we learn from waste last year, what can we do better next year, transformed into something they do every week. The second one I want to talk about is um, a ranging problem. So this is what products do we put in which stores. It's for, a, it's for one of the big supermarkets in the UK. It's a project we're working on actively at the moment. And what they wanted to know was how do we customize the product range to meet the needs of local shoppers? So, again, a similar scale of problem. Actually, in this case, billions of data points. Uh, when you start looking into every basket, uh, all the items in every basket in every superstore across um, a couple of years, it's billions of data points. And we're trying to understand local producers, what, um, what flavor preferences do people have in certain areas? Do they have particular types of products they like? Um, I won't uh, try and go into all the, 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 the insights that come out of this. There have been hundreds, but it's helping them to start to um, tackle the problem. And so, why is it? There's lots of reasons it's a too tough thing to solve. And certainly, this, this um, supermarket, up until very recently, had, um, had a simple sort of national ranging policy, nothing um, particularly local about it. But they have announced this as a key strategic driver. They've announced it to the, to the city, to the, to the stock exchange, and they recognize there's tens of millions of pounds of benefit if they can get this right. So absolutely worth solving. Again, simple set of visuals that form part of a pack that every buyer now gets as part of their uh, weekly uh, information that show them how they're trading and what local preferences are starting to emerge in any given area. Result? Over a million pounds of benefit from the first four categories that have tried this. We've just be, um, we started work on this project in, in March. The first four categories have gone through it. Uh, unfortunately, we sold the project far too cheaply because they've now got a return on investment of several hundred percent off the first four of 80 categories that we're working on with them. Uh, my fault. But, um, but they're moving from a national range to regional variants. Okay, so to close up, I wanted to try and leave you some practical advice. Seven steps to everyday easy. How do you get from the things that uh, you and your colleagues back in the office will say are just too tough, things you can't do, how do you get from that to practical answers? So first of all, pick something. It doesn't matter what, pick anything off the too tough list. Look at any of those things you do on an annual basis that no one wants to get round to, uh, just pick it. Find out what you do know and what you don't know about it. So look at this from the point of view of how do we report on it today and how could we analyze what we don't know about it. So from the unknown list, what are the things we don't know, what information would help to inform that? And it's probably an awful le lot less than you think. So yes, you might need to attack a very large set of data, but actually you may need relatively few bits of information from it. <laughs> Collect it, store it, visualize it. I've talked about that already, and you've certainly seen a great demonstration from Tableau earlier on an approach to solving that. Assess the value of the new information that comes out. The real aim here is to generate something that you didn't know before and to use that to power um, a, a business process. But does the value of it, of solving this problem, outweigh the cost? Trial it with users. And then make sure when you deploy it that you have periodic updates. A lot of the work we're doing here is only updated once a week or once a month. It's not truly live. It doesn't actually need to be truly live in order to be extremely useful. And I think that's the thing we can all get hung up on as analysts. I know I'm guilty of it at times, is focusing on trying to solve the problem perfectly when actually a good approximation is an awful lot easier, faster, and just as useful to your, uh, your end users, your customers, uh, and your colleagues. So jump in with both feet. Give it a go and see how you get on. Thank you very much.